I'll have to say that's uh, seeing St the Steve's presentation. It was pretty exciting to see uh, all the developments with aid data. Um, Got to preview this just a bit yesterday, but really fantastic to see what's come of this. Um, in many day, in many ways, aid data began uh, because of a lack of information and uh, the need to go out and, and collect more information to answer a variety of different questions, research or policy or otherwise. Um, and and now we're, we're we're in this world where there's lots and lots of information, thanks to a data, thanks to the World Bank, thanks to many other parties who are working so hard to make all these data available. Um, you know, w with all the information that has that has come online, you know, one of the big challenges has been how to how do we deal with this? And so this was one of the motivations for working on geocoding. And as Steve mentioned, that's something I've had a, a part in. So let me just give you a little bit more information about geocoding um, and how we, we we did this. So in collaboration with partners at Uppsala University, um, uh, part of the uh, individuals from the Uppsala Conflict Data Program who had been geocoding uh, battle data uh, for armed conflicts worldwide. Uh, we began talking about how we could take a geocoding methodology designed for uh, conflict and apply it to the aid context. And so, so we, uh, beginning with aid data projects, we, we worked through lots of them and uh, worked through lots of project descriptions, uh, coupled that with this methodology and tried to identify what are some of the rules we need to be able to be uh, rigorous valid, and, and, and come up with valid and reliable codes. Uh, for a third party or for someone working within an organization, how can you read across geographic information and, 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 and code it in such a way that it's meaningful? And so we developed this methodology that has uh, a, a number of different precision codes that allow us to take even somewhat vague information and still, in some cases, be able to assign uh, somewhat vague codes, okay, or a code that signifies that, that we don't have as much information as we'd like. But in many cases, we have wonderful information, and so we can code all the way down to uh, you know, very low levels of aggregation. So we could capture uh, administrative districts first and second order or even further, but we can also go beyond and code at village level uh, and, and so forth. And so, um, and in many ways, this information, uh, being, being able to use geocoding and then some of the other tools, dashboards and other things that are being developed has helped us uh, begin to make a little bit more sense of, of the information out there. And so... Um, but we're, you know, even with even with visualization, in many ways, we're still uh, in this world that um, Jean Louis and others have referred to as uh, we're we're now trying to drink from the fire hydrant or drink from the fire hose, so to speak. And so we have lots and lots of information, and we have lots and lots of visualizations, and um, uh, and more information, and more visualizations, and more information, and more visualizations, and more information and more visualizations. Hopefully I've made my point, right? Um, and you know this, right? I mean, we keep seeing this. And so, um, and, 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 and before going further, I should say, you know, I'm, I applaud all this and I support all this, um, and I think that this is the right way to go. Um, and visualizations and, and dashboards and everything else hold a great deal of promise for us uh, collectively moving forward. Uh, but Steve asked me to say something a little more provocative, so... Um, I'll, I'll try to do that now um, with, with his and your permission. Um, so I'm going to make two key points uh, moving forward. Uh, one is that visualization does indeed help make sense of information. Okay? Um, I, think that's, I think that's crucial, and it takes us, it takes us a long way. Um, and, but maybe slightly more provocative, I think neither information nor visualization actually imply that we will learn. Okay? So having information available, having data available is useful, right? Um, but it doesn't imply that we'll actually learn and learn the correct lessons from that information. And as we move forward and as we move to, uh, to, to geocoding and dashboards and all the other many uh, wonderful things we're doing, um, hopefully we can inject an element of caution. And, 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 and I know many people are very cautious about this, and, um, but, but just sort of discuss this more explicitly, some of the things we ought to be cautious about as we, as we move forward. Um, uh, so that we, so so that importantly, we we really avoid the illusion of learning. Okay, simply having more information sometimes makes us feel better because we have all this new data. We feel like everyone's being more transparent, and uh, we have so much more to work with. But are we really learning the, the the right lessons we need to learn from all of this new information and from the visualizations that that come from this? Okay, so let me um, let me apply this to. Uh, 
just very quickly to kind of three key questions that I, I think have come up a lot in, in various conferences and, and workshops over the last year or so, uh, some of the ways we might be applying geocoding and, and some of the lessons we're learning. So um, let me, uh, and, and, and so hopefully we can consider where, where, what, what do we sort of get out of geocoding and some of these things when it comes to information and visual, visualization. So the three things are here, targeting of need, donor coordination, and, and recipient feedback. Okay, so, so as we've talked about, uh, geocoding, of course, allows fund tracking at the subnational level. Okay, it's not perfect, right, but we have a much better sense of what's going on at the subnational level um, thanks to, to, to geocoding. And one of the key questions we want to be able to answer is, is aid reaching the neediest? That's not the only question, right, but that's one question that we want to be able to ask and, and hopefully be able to answer. So just to use kind of a, uh, an example here, and lots of these maps have been going up over the last year or so. Um, here, here's an example of Ethiopia, and what we have mapped here are the project locations for both the World Bank and the African Development Bank. Uh, World Bank in green, African Development Bank in yellow, the circles, okay? And then subnational poverty uh, in the background, uh, but by administrative district. And so if you'll just indulge me for a, a minute and, and think through here, what do we learn from this and what don't we learn, okay? Um, as we look at this, you know, one thing that is, seems pretty evident is that uh, there's a, a, a fair amount of clustering, okay? Um, and the clustering seems to occur primarily in sort of these medium levels of po regions with medium levels of poverty relative to the other regions, okay? And uh, in, the, in the areas, the sort of the darkest red, um, have uh, some coverage, good coverage in some cases, not very good in others, uh, such as in the northern uh, this area up here. And so we learn a little bit from this. We learn that, you know, it looks like there's, uh, you know, aid is potentially addressing poverty. And of course, aid's given for all sorts of reasons, and we're aggregating in terms of like sector purposes and things like that. But uh, in general, we see that aid's going to, to needy areas, maybe not the neediest areas. Um, but we, we miss a little bit with a simple map like this, because all we have is aid and we have poverty. Okay. okay? But we miss things like population density. Uh, if we were to put up a population density map, we find that you know, a lot of the aids actually go into uh, to, uh, to, to where we would think uh, in the middle of the country there's uh, pretty good representation. But in the northernmost part of the country, there's actually a decent amount of uh, population up here, and there's very little aid going there. So maybe this helps us learn a little bit more about whether we're getting aid to the neediest places, but also to um, the, the neediest places with the most people as well, right? And maybe we learn a little bit about um, missing uh, some of the other regions, uh, such as this northernmost region. But how do we really know whether aid helps? Putting dots on a map takes us somewhere. It helps us begin to ask the, ask the right questions. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there's still a lot more we would need to investigate to, to be able to truly understand whether aid is actually having some sort of like causal impact. And so the question I'll throw out there is, are, are, are visualizations going to mislead users? Um, if all we do is put up a lot of maps and we, may, we create platforms that can be used in countries and uh, CSO, NGOs, CSOs, individuals go on and find maps, uh, without having a lot of the other information there, are, is it going to be misleading in some ways, right? I mean, are we going to draw the, the wrong lessons uh, out of some of these types of data? A second area, uh, donor coordination. So do donors coordinate to target areas of need? And uh, that, that could involve geographic clustering in areas of concentrated need. Okay? Uh, it could also mean that the donors spread out in areas of, of diffuse need. So just to give an example, it's a map of World Bank and African Development Bank project locations in Kenya. Okay? Uh, again, World Bank in green, African Development Bank in yellow. Uh, poverty is shaded in the background with darker colors, meaning uh, higher levels of poverty. And uh, as we look at this, it becomes clear that there's lots and lots and lots of clustering, right, uh, through, the, through sort of the southern corridor of the country. And if we were to look at, if we were to bring in a population density map, we'd see that most of the population is in this area. So, you know, some of these things make sense. Um, but one thing that comes out is that some of the poorest or so the neediest areas actually are not covered here, okay? Maybe with the exception of the, uh, of, of the southeast corner, okay, along the coast. Um, most of the, the poorest areas are getting almost no aid, right? And so in a case like this, we might have to conclude that, well, 
donors uh, are clustering, which could be a good thing if they were clustering in the right places. And again, I'm not trying to make a definitive statement that they're in the wrong places, but sort of based on kind of this view of it, you know, maybe they're not, maybe they could be in better places together coordinating, right? Or at least coordinating to send more of the aid uh, to the northernmost part of the country or the, or the, excuse me, the northeast part of the country where poverty levels are higher. Um, uh, together with Josh Powell of, of Development Gateway, um, we tried to we, we did this kind of the same exercise for six different countries in Africa, uh, where we took World Bank and African Development Bank projects and we mapped them to to see how coordinated they were. And, and what we did is we very simply calculated uh, we, we very simply calculated how concentrated the need is in the country. Uh, so sort of the scale between concentrated and diffuse, and then we measured how clustered uh, the, the two donors are. Okay. And so, presumably, high, cl uh, high concentration in need, we should see high clustering, not presumably. That's what we might hope. With high clustering of need, high, there, there should be a, a high concentration of need should, should lead to, to high clustering in those areas and, and so forth. Um, so here's just kind of a simple um, uh, depiction of, of our findings. Um, we find that in the case of Kenya, again, there's pretty concentrated need by the measures we used. And there is fairly high clustering in Kenya. But... They kind of occurred in the wrong places, okay? So we sort of put up a, a square here instead of a, a diamond, suggesting that a, a diamond may be sort of optimal by this measure. Um, and so we kind of are, are observing the, the clustering in areas of, uh, of knee, uh, excuse me, clustering and concentration, but we, we, we see it in the wrong places, right? And then in Tanz Tanz Tanzania, low clustering, diffuse need, but, we're, you know, but, but the way they're sort of coordinating doesn't seem to be optimal. Um, the only case that sort of held up in this, in this sort of preliminary analysis was the DRC um, seemed to have uh, moderate levels of, of need, moderate levels of clustering, and it appeared to be kind of in the places that we might expect from it, right? And so, um, so from this, you know, uh, you know, we question sort of is, is clustering inherently problematic? Uh, we've used the metaphor a lot of uh, the, swarm, the, the soccer games, right, and the swarm principle uh, has come up, you know, that all the, all the kids all chase the ball around no matter where it is. Well, that actually might be okay, right? I mean, if the ball is, 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 the need, is the most important part, I mean, if it's the neediest area, then clustering is not inherently problematic. Um, but there may be needs to actually spread out, uh, you know, much more. And, of course, again, as sort of the kind of to continue this theme, we might be missing other things here. We might be missing co-financing um, and, and other variables of interest that might explain why the different donors uh, are doing what they're doing. And so a definitive conclusion based on this would, be, would be, certainly be premature. Okay, finally, uh, and quickly, recipient feedback. Um, so geocoding makes possible leveraging the wisdom of crowds uh, through decentralized citizen and NGO feedback. Um, this has been discussed a lot uh, lately as well, and uh, this morning, and, and pretty much every forum we seem to go to. And there seems to hold a lot of promise, um, you know, to be able to take uh, information from a higher level and couple that with information from a lower level, or maybe, maybe those aren't the correct terms, sort of on-the-ground information from CSO groups, journalists, uh, others, we get a much better, you know, hopefully we'll get a much better picture of what the aid uh, landscape uh, li looks like. And, but it does raise questions. I mean, if, uh, you know, if you build it, will they really come, right? Um, we sort of talk a lot in the abstract about you know, making platforms available, making maps available, getting information out there with almost the assumption that people are going to go find those maps and they're going to go find the infrastructure and they're going to provide that feedback. And, and you know, and, 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 and most likely if you build it, they probably will come to some extent, but how can you build the house so that everyone comes or, or the most people come to it, right? And, uh, you know, technology is not really the issue here. Uh, other things might be the issue that we need to go beyond just creating the platforms and actually do more, right? I mean, we need to uh, know where the locations are um, and have really good information about that in, in ways that people on the ground could go identify it. Um, so earlier this year, uh, on a research trip in Uganda, I decided to take geocodes from our World Bank uh, partnership, Mapping for Results, and I spent a couple of days, and I just traveled around Uganda and just tried to find these project locations, okay? And... The good news is, um, in, in most cases, I could find them. I, I was relieved. <laughs> so um, not that I worried all that much, but, um, but you know, some are relieved to find them. But, but you, would you would come to the, many, of them, many of them, and there was no sign posted out front. Okay? So I would go into clinics, and I would say, okay, you know, according to our little map here, you've got you know, funding from the World Bank. And, uh, you know, and sit, sit down with the director, and the director would say, yeah, I think that's right. I 
think we have money from the World Bank. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, we, we have money from the World Bank, but it all it comes through the health and the Ministry of Health, and it, you know, there are several cha- steps in the chain. And this is a story you know, right? But, but the punchline here for crowdsourcing is um, there's no sign posted out front. How would anyone in that village even know money came from the World Bank or DFID or USAID or anywhere else, right? And so having the maps is important, right? But taking the next steps to be able to make sure people know and can connect the map with the actual location in the absence of other types of information. So location is one thing. Uh, Incentives is another. Um, And uh, just to put a a plug in for Dan Nielsen's talk this afternoon, um, we were very interested in in, uh, trying to understand what what sort of incentive structure do you need to have people crowdsource information. And so uh, we worked together with with UNICEF in Uganda, and I won't give many details, but uh, with UNICEF and World Bank and Ushahidi, to try to do a little pilot here where we varied the, you know, the incentive structures. Okay? And the results are very interesting um, to sort of see what, what sorts of motivations do people need to provide crowdsource feedback. I'll let Dan, talk, uh, Dan, will, Dan will do all the talking on the results later. But um, anyway, but we learned interesting things at, that, that suggest it's, it's not about technology, but it's also a whole lot more than just sort of creating uh, you know, a lot of the infrastructure. We've got to go beyond that. Okay. So let me just conclude with a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that uh, uh, development is complex, right? And um, you're all saying, yes, we know it's complex. That's right, <laughs> yes. Um, so it is complex. Uh, we need other types of information, uh, clearly. Uh, you know, the panel earlier today, I think, was, was wonderful in talking about how important it is that we have money, uh, we sort of track money from governments, right? From, uh, from the recipient governments, their own resources and expenditures. Uh, tracking money from NGOs, right? Uh, private citizens in other contexts, uh, a variety of different, different uh, pieces of information we really need before we can answer these questions, okay? To go back to, we have information, but will we learn, right? In order to learn, in many ways, we need to fill in some of the gaps here. Uh, we need better information on aid and need over time, okay? Uh, one of the, it seems like the movement in the last couple of years is to, is to get uh, information uh, broadly, but not so deeply, okay? And to be able to answer questions about the effects of aid, and this came up on the first panel, um, how long does it take for education aid to have an effect, right? It's going to take a while. And so just having geocodes and sort of other really in-depth, uh, you know, information for the last couple of years is wonderful, right? I mean, it's a, hu- it's a huge step forward to have all this so accessible. But we've got to, we've got to push backward as well, um, at least, you know, 10 years, 20 years, so that we can begin to... Uh, be able to do more sophisticated analysis and understand whether aid is having some sort of impact over time. Um, and then we need to be careful um, about sort of the you know, omitted variables, hidden variables, in these when we just sort of look at maps um, and some of these other uh, visualizations that there's a lot of things going on and it's, you know, our, our minds can't, can't process a whole lot of information all at one time. I mean, uh, I think that's sort of fairly well established in most of the psychological literature and elsewhere. I mean, we look at things and we're drawn to things, and we can we can include other things uh, sort of in our in our processing. But the world again is is complex and, and possibly a little too complex for some of the visualizations that we use. Um, you know, a, a different strategy which which seems to be very promising is to to go with randomized controlled trials. Uh, in the sense that with a randomized controlled trial, in many ways we can take all those omitted variables, observable or unobservable, and we can uh, sort of neutralize their effect through the, through the process of randomization. And so we may not need to go out and have all the information out there in order to conduct studies moving forward. Uh, in many ways, the ideal or the gold standard might be to have more randomized controlled trials in which we hold everything else constant and manipulate one variable of interest at a time and as we manip- manipulate that one variable of interest, um, you know, maybe we learn a whole lot more and we can, we can more credibly uh, claim that we've solved some of the, uh, 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 the threats to, ca- to appropriate causal inference. So just to, just to close, then, we're betting on transparency and visualization, and I'm fully on board, completely on board with this. Don't worry. Um, but again, just kind of as a take-home point, uh, please, you know, I mean, more information is, is good, and it does, and we learn from it, right? But it does not imply learning potentially in the larger sense. Uh, visualization also does not imply learning. I mean, we have to sort of go beyond, um, we have to sort of continue to press forward on the path we're on, but take that down the, the route of trying to make sure we can learn from the information. So, uh, uh, so, so in the race for more information, let's, let's definitely uh, take the time to learn. Thanks.